Thank you all so much for being here. I know when middle of the week is a tough time, and so I, I really appreciate it. I also do want to thank the English Department and the Arizona Institute for the Humanities, and especially thank Dan Devona, Devaney Lozier, Ron Broglio, Cora Fox, and so many other people who've made this a very special visit already today. Um, and I also, and I wanted to also congratulate Ron on a fabulous new book he has in the area of, of animal studies called Technologies of the Picturesque, British Art, Poetry, and Instruments, 1750 to 1830, which you should all read if you haven't yet. Um, and I'm especially honored to be here as the Ian Fletcher lecturer because given what I was, I've read about him and seen his important contributions to the field of Victorian studies, I've also really thought about the way this lecture has such a special place in your department and the fact that you memorialize one of your colleagues by annually creating this, this moment of uh, intellectual companionship is, is very special and I'm grateful to be part of that. Okay. We, oh, let's see, I need to, there we go. We seem to see them everywhere now. The web, can y'all hear me? Do I need to do that? Is that better? Yep. The web mews, barks, growls, and hisses with alleged evidence of interspecies attachment. One of the first unexpected pairings to take social media by storm was the 130-year-old Aldabra Cordis Maisie and a young hippopotamus named Owen. After being separated from his herd in the tsunami of 2004, Owen landed in the Haller Park Animal Sanctuary in Kenya. There, to everyone's surprise, he attached himself to this tortoise and they were inseparable for two years until Owen's size became a threat to Maisie and he was moved in with another rescued hippopotamus, Cleo. They lived happily ever after. Their strange and to many sweetly miraculous pairing has been the subject of children's books, documentaries, and YouTube videos. They also started their own tsunami of interspecies memes Jennifer Holland, a contributing writer for National Geographic, rode that wave to a series of bestsellers, starting with her 2011 book, Unlikely Friendships, 50 Remarkable Stories from the Animal Kingdom. One of the thousands of photographs shared in the years after Owen and Maisie appeared was this image of a rhesus macaw and a ring-tailed dove. It was taken in China in 2007 in a national nature preserve where the two lived together for two months. This photo became the cover of Holland's first book. Sure, we go. Here we go. <clears throat> and Amazon reviews and the many Facebook fans who delight in these representations of animal friendships read the book's cover through an almost disturbingly human sentimental lens despite a growing body of work. Sorry about that. By researchers like Franz de Waal and Mark Beckoff on animal emotions and cognition. Back to, so this is her, oops, stay with her cover there. In the cover photograph, the young Macau rhesus monkey clings to a dove. But what do we make of the expression on the small, near-human face as it attempts to grip a species so unlike itself and its actual mother? The dove is so non-mammalian in its features and shape that the monkey's stance seems more indicative of fear and abandonment than pleasure. As a National Reserve staff member at, at the camp, place where they were kept succinctly says in the book, if only the dove had hands to hug him back. Here, as in so many recent cases, images of interspecies attachment with and without humans as one of those species, in these we see a contradictory argument. Explicitly, we see the, in this case, melancholy adaptation of utterly unlike species to the necessities of physical and psychological survival. 
Not only would this infant become prey to another animal left on its own and just be unable to care itself for itself, but infants of many species, including humans, can die of what is called very simply failure to thrive. Many of us long to read images like this as hopeful that differences can be bridged and bonding can happen among humans as other species, despite all odds, a version of what Donna Haraway so beautifully describes as knotted entanglements in her book, When Species Meet. But once I step back from my own animal adoring, voyeuristic pleasure, I also see the way that implicitly Interspecies memes, even where humans are invisible, as here, remind us of what it often costs animals for us to be near them. The possibility that far more species than humans possess emotions was also a preoccupation in the 19th century. Late in his career, Charles Darwin asked whether emotions could cross species lines in his book, The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals from 1872. Drawing upon the etymology of the word emotion, which emphasized physical movement, Darwin ventured that across species lines, emotions could be determined outwardly in the lines of the body. The book took a surprising turn to Lamarck's earlier use inheritance theory, which was the hypothesis that a repeated habit could become attached to an emotion and then inherited by future generations. If you'd like to test Darwin's theories, you can visit the U University of California Darwin Corris or Cambridge Darwin Correspondence Emotion Experiment to see whether you can correctly guess the emotions based on facial expressions in 10 photographs that Darwin used in his research. Though Darwin's theory was largely discredited a few years later, the fascination with cross-species emotion lingered. In her magisterial study, Picturing Animals in, 19, in Britain, 1750 to 1850, Diana Donald discusses Darwin's followers, like George Romanes, author of Animal Intelligence, published in 1882, who continued to argue for cross-species shaping of the emotions. Romanes argued that the psychological character of dogs in particular is, quote, molded by human agency. Dogs, he argued, take on human characteristics. Like Darwin, he, he leaned very heavily on anecdotes rather than what we would now consider science to argue that the result of contact between species led to emotions that cross species boundaries, or at least that emotions crossed from human to non-human species. It would be impossible in our time together for me to trace a thorough history of the evolution of the interspecies meme over time, but what I want to do instead is to look at several moments in the last two centuries, visual and literary represent when visual and literary representations of the interspecies meme insistently surfaced in Britain and the U.S. Today I'll be focusing on visual and literary text from 19th century Britain, but also from our own historical moment that invite us to consider when and why shifting fantasies about interspecies hierarchy, agency, and attachment go viral. On one hand, the images are haunted by complex intertwinings of the desire to love and control and the consequent precarity of non-human animals. More optimistically, on the other hand, the images also sometimes capture a genuine longing to understand rather than own or control the animal other. Just as Holland put out the call for unlikely friendships, I'm eager to find instances of interspecies interaction in which species, including humans, are being reimagined within larger networks of place, within broad-based environmental studies, and with commitment to imagining other species' points of view, as we see in the work of Haraway and Barbara Schmutz, who worked with, has worked with several species. Now, I should also confess something to you. I have become increasingly convinced that without awakening empathy, and I mean a kind of moral species-decentered empathy, 
for animals, even for the earth, and without forming deep attachments to local and global ecosystems and becoming willing citizen advocates for those systems, a fear for our future. These images ask us what love means to us, what good and terrible things we've done to other species in the name of love, and what adaptations we would be willing to make in the service of environmental ethics when that love crosses species lines. Though Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species, 1859, would seem like the most likely point of departure for a study of interspecies representations in the 19th century, when it comes to popular culture, the Bible may be an even more pervasive influence, especially the King James Version of Genesis. Firmly and repeatedly asserting the dominion model of human-animal relationships, Genesis grants man authority over all other species. In, 1855, in 1865, Gustave Doré published a lavishly illustrated Vulgate Bible in France with 160 Old Testament plates and 81 New Testament plates. This family Bible, very expensive, along with many cheaper editions, were published in England soon after. As we see in Doré's engraving from the 1866 Illustrated Bible, the origins of species in Christianity are habitat, earth, air, and water, and the movements that animals use to navigate those habitats. On day four of the first biblical account of creation, because there is more than one, quote, the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creatures that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth. Cattle, creeping things, and beasts of the earth appear on day five. Later in book two, God grants the power of naming animals to Adam. However, even in this early account of divine order, we see the instability of species hierarchy. After all, the serpent triumphs over Eve. We encounter another flaw in biblical species hierarchy when God speaks to Noah in book nine after the flood. God decrees that non-human animals will hereafter be affectively alienated from other creatures. He, the Bible, the King James Version of the Bible says, and the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all fishes of the sea. Unto your hand are they delivered. Emotion, language, and favoritism all seem to assert human exceptionalism. But God also recognizes animals as legal subjects. The covenant that God makes is a promise that he will never again unleash a worldwide devastating flood. Twice, he asserts that this covenant, quote, is between me and you and every living creature. The centuries of interspecies representations that follow could be thought of as a struggle to fill this gulf between subjectivity and subjugation of non-human animals. A leap through time to 19th century art and literature provides more recent, and from our point of view, more immediately influential species, interspecies relationships. But that leap does not leave the Bible far behind. While animals continue to be used even today as signs rather than subjects, a constellation of developments in the 19th century caused a seismic shift in attitudes toward domestic animals. All my 19th century animal friends know this, but for all the, all the rest of us, to quickly catalog a few of these forces, in addition to evolutionary biology, changes included, included breeding experiments, the rise of pet culture, the ubiquity of menageries, animal acts and zoos, hunting across the globe, both for wild game and for scientific specimens, which crowded natural history museums with taxidermy, a growing animal welfare movement, and studies of urban psychology and sociology that encompassed animals as well as humans. 
In Victorian visual and literary culture, interspecies relationships from what anthropologist Mary Louise Pratt would call a contact zone where imperial fantasies of dominion, popularized, simple, simplified, and often garbled versions of survival of the fittest tropes, sentimentalized domesticity, and biblical narratives of hierarchy meet. If we have video and photo memes, the Victorians had Edward Landseer. His paintings, his prints, and his reproductions. A wildly successful animal painter, sculptor, and illustrator, Landseer was Queen Victoria's favorite and a fixture in Royal Academy exhibitions. Reproductions, now I need another a new word from Julie for that. Uh, and critical commentary about Landseer's work circulated widely in periodical literature, introducing a lar much larger public to his work. To suggest the diverse ways his paintings influenced, not necessarily perceptions of, but rather feelings about species and interspecies, I want to show you two types of paintings among the many genres represented in Landseer's work. <laughs> we'll stay with the stag for a minute. First, Landseer was greatly admired for animal portraits, which anticipated fictional autobiographies you all know, like Black Beauty, 1877, although I am often fascinated. What gender do you think Black Beauty was? Almost all of my students think Black Beauty is a female. No, male. And I'm really curious about why that's true. Um, so these portraits anticipate animal autobiographies like Black Beauty that appeared with increasing frequency in the second half of the 19th century. We still recognize many of these paintings, here we go, thanks to their migration into 20th century advertising. The Monarch of the Glen that we were just looking at is an image of a red deer stag painted in 1849-51. An interesting story about it, it was actually painted for the refreshment room of the House of Lords who then refused to pay for it. And so it was exhibited repeatedly, 1851, 74, and 90, um, but then went into private hands. In the, this painting poses a stunning stag against craggy mountains. The portrait has a really interesting status in Scotland, and some of you may have seen uh, evidence of this. Its afterlife includes absurd advertisements by Challenge Butter, Pear Soap, and in the United States, of course, Hartford Financial Services. In 2016, Diageo, if I'm pronouncing that wrong, a distillery, bought the painting for, put up the painting for auction, and the National Galleries of Scotland worked feverishly to raise $4 million because the distillery said, if you can raise $4 million, we'll, we'll put in the other $4 million. And the painting successfully stayed in Scotland. This was seen as just a, a horror if it were to go back out of Scotland. I mentioned the painting's recent history because it reminds us that even a solitary portrait of an animal or a solitary actual animal is incapable of escaping interspecies engagement. So overwhelming is human presence in the management, staging, articulation, and situating of species, a reality that our use of animals in art makes especially clear. Another famous example of Landseer's portraits is his 1867, The Wild Cattle of Chillingham. And it turns out there are herds in Texas and Iowa, and I have seen them in Iowa. The painting is a fascinating display of feral domesticity. As Harriet Ritbow points out, even though the Earl of Tankerville, who was the owner of the chief herd in Victorian Britain, enclosed these cattle in a park, huge park, he insisted on what Ritvo calls the glamour of their wildness. Ritvo also points out that the painting was hung with companion paintings of a stag, a doe, and a fawn in Chillingham Castle, offering a complex and layered identification of these imposing cattle with both the ancient wildness they inhabited and the noble family that owned them. If Darwin and Romanes argued for cross-species emotions, though, Landseer's portraits argue for their dignity as animals. The animal subjects in the painting engage with us as an adamantly unhuman species. 
In Landseer's portraits, we look at the animals looking at us and not in a particularly flattering way. As John Berger argued in Wild Look at Animals in the 70s, that reversed gaze disturbs human sense of their exceptionalism, noting that if humans can surprise animals, animals can also to surprise humans, Berger writes, thus a power is ascribed to the animal comparable with human power but never coinciding with it. The animal has secrets which unlike the secrets of caves, mountains, seas, are specifically addressed to man. Jacques Derrida also famously discussed the unnerving effect of his cat's gaze in the well-known um, article and book, The Animal That Therefore I Am. The portraits Lanciers created invite reciprocal respect. Standing in front of the actual paintings might even prompt feelings of humility before the grand animalness of Lanciers animal subjects. The impulse of our species is to capture, in myriad senses of that word, the inner being of other species Inspire, and that impulse inspired innumerable literary analogs to Landseer's portraits in the 19th century. Fictional autobiographies are a wonderful condensation of the realist effect that so strongly appealed to Victorian literary taste. Landseer's portraits pay an almost photographic attention to the surface details that insist upon the specificity of both individual and species. But animal portraits, biographies, and autobiographies are equally indebted to another realist influence, the rise of psychology and a growing belief in an interior, invisible consciousness. The simultaneous attention to surface and hidden being as species can be seen in the rise of animal autobiographies across the end of the century. And just to name a few examples, Francis Power Cobb, who fought for animal welfare and an end to vivisection, wrote Confessions of a Lost Dog in 1867 so that another species than us could make its case for itself. The veterinarian novelist with a fabulously Dickensian name, Gordon Stables, created a canine community in Sable and White, the autobiography of a show collie in 1894. Like Anna Sewell's Black Beauty, the novel uses the autobiographical form to imagine animal consciousness as the dog or horse ages. And that aging process really pushes detail to descriptions of animal bodies in interesting, um, fascinating ways. In these autobiographies, of an, of, of imagined autobiographies of animals, humans are crucial, but they're peripheral. Standing before portraits that try to translate animal subjectivity into human terms. Writing these fanciful novels off as silly anthropomorphism ignores readers' pleasure in the character's animalness. As in the paintings, the most interesting of these novels insist on the unique characteristics of species as essential elements of character and plot. That animality is even more crucial to narratives in which ordinary animals serve as unknowable others. Think about the abused bulldog in Oliver Twist, Bullseye is his name, whose loyalty becomes terrifying when his pack instinct threatens to lead the police to his murderous owner, Bill Sykes. In all of these instances, the emphasis on the individual at once romanticizes a particular species and mutes attention to the species as species by focusing on viewers' attention to what I sometimes think of as an animal ethics. That is, species-specific qualities of animals that exist somewhere between instinct and a learned code of behavior. The stag's stance suggests aloofness, distance, physical power. It stands in not just for deer, but for nature's grandeur, not as an abstraction, but as the beautiful coat, antlers, and nostrils, the body of the deer. The Chillingham cattle are distinctly atypical of their species in remaining wild, yet the portrait alludes to the most conventional human family values, 
The strong, wary male defends his female mate, her eyes demurely cast down and toward her calf. But rather than imitating humans, I would argue that the paintings attract us because they are a genuine attempt to portray animals and their animal ethics, which we can only dimly grasp through fantasy. Landseer took over my talk today because he is also a useful pivot for studying changes in cultural uses of interspecies scenes with and without human subjects as one of those species. Nowhere is his interest in a cross-species engagement more instructive than in his studies of the American showman Isaac Van Amberg, who lived 1802 to 1873. Van Amberg's menagerie fascinated Victorians, including the queen herself. In Isaac Van Amberg and his animals exhibited this painting, exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1839, we find the famous lion tamer reclining with his fierce cats as spectators outside gawk through the cage. The painting captures the final tableau of Van Amberg's lion performance. Our point of view is from a low angle that sends our gaze up at a magnificent lion sitting sedately above and behind Von Amberg and a growling tiger whose claws fasten on his leg even as the showman scratches the tiger's head. Opposite the tiger, a lamb pushes nervously against Van Amberg's chest. Leopards and lions sur surround the highlighted trio of tiger, man, and lamb. The grim unspoken reality of this intimacy is that most animal tamer, tamers in the 1830s and 40s built these relationships through brute conditioning. Van Amberg's stage presence is described in the animal training trade as working wild. In contrast with acts that ran animals through a series of what were obviously learned tricks and postures. He was reputed to subdue the animals with a crowbar during training and to use a whip or stick and gunshots during the performances. The young Queen Victoria's description naively captures this dynamic. She wrote, one can never see it too often in her journal for January 29, 1839. Von Umberg has great power over the animals and they seem to love him, though I think they are in great fear of him. He took them by their paws, throwing them down and making them roar, and he lay upon them after enraging them. The painting asserts the divine justice of this violence through biblical allusions. The lamb invokes Isaiah's prophecy that the return of paradise will be marked by the peaceful coexistence of species led by a little child, turning the animal tamer into an Adamic steward of species. Yet the visual flattening of the hierarchy, most of the beings are piled upon one another on the floor, creates a tense balance of competing forms of power. In this interspecies encounter, the viewer's pleasure comes from the silent struggle between an animal threat of savagery and implicit human bravery and kindness so irresistible that a man can afford to rest indolently among these predators as though his affect alone quells their true natures. That tension is heightened through an allusion to another biblical scene, Daniel and the lions. And if you'll indulge me, I just wanna quickly show you two images that were very popular in the period of the scene. This first one is from Doré's illustrated Bible again of Daniel in the lion's den. But I'm kind of in love with this Britain Riviere, which was often reprinted, um, titled Don, Don, uh, Daniel in the lion's den, 1874. King Darius, if you remember in the, the book of Daniel, is tricked by political shenanigans into throwing Daniel to the lions. To his amazement, Daniel survives. Quote, and when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God hath sent his angel and has shut the lions' mouths that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him innocency was found in me and also before thee, O king, have I done thee no hurt. 
According to Van Amberg's biographer, H. Frost, quote, it was rem that remarkable and wonderful episode in biblical history found in the sixth chapter of Daniel that induced Mr. Van Amberg to contemplate the possibility of subduing the whole animal kingdom. And while pondering over the escape of Daniel from the lion's den, he conceived that the miracles had not expired and at once resolved to solve the problem. The biographer marvels that in Van Amberg's show, the lion licked the hand that overcame him and knelt at his con conqueror's feet. The leopard fondled as playful as a domestic tabby. The tiger rolled on his sides while Van Amberg placed his foot on his back and laid the now docile panther between his paws. Now the tableau of the proud king of animal creation. This and many other descriptions infantilize the big cats, even as reviewers marvel at their strength. The striking scene of interspecies struggle is almost reduced to family drama. Reviewers commented both on Van Amberg's brutality and his bravado. In a, in a chapter on 19th century lion tamers in a book by um, Helen Cowie called Exhibiting Animals in 19th Century Britain, she quotes a reviewer from the Preston Chronicle who wittily captures both sides of Van Amberg. The reviewer writes, Van Amberg had, put, had one of his fingers bitten off Tuesday, last at Falmouth, by the lion. Let him beware his head. To those who protested his brutality, Van Amberg quoted yet another biblical passage, Genesis 1:26, that I discussed earlier. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over, etc., etc." Thus, Van Amberg reinforced religious claims and courted popularity by developing stage and road shows in which he acted out the scenes from the Bible dependent on species difference as well as dominion. Not all Victorians worshipped at his altar, however. Many Victorians remained attentive to the complexities of interspecies attachment entangled with brute subjugation. An 1865 obituary in the magazine Flag of Our Union ignores the Bible and focuses on the relationship the reviewer see, the, the writer sees in the flesh, recalling that after a tiger attacked von Amberg so fiercely that he was left with protruding bowels, the writer adds, he tamed the animal finally and made him a great pet. These reviews suggest that the model of dom domination never fully explains the relationships that bound these animal tamers and animals together and, does, and that so, doesn't alone, the do, domination, draw spectators to the shows and to the painting. Reading against the grain of the domination plot, I find the decision <clears throat> to position spectators within the cage fascinating. Let's see if I'm on the right one here. We are invited to dissociate ourselves from the puny humans outside the cage because we're in there with the animals. The monarch in this frame is the lion, powerful and beatific, perhaps as a compliment to the queen who commissioned the painting. The light falls on the lazily snarling tiger and timid lamb, highlighting the fantasy of coexistence. One of the leopards watches the humans with a slightly bemused expression mirroring the soldier's reciprocal gaze. In effect, despite those biblical allusions, this is a community of diverse species looking at a group of diverse spectators, bright faces and dark, old and young, with some class variation. The physical force of the scene might lie in von Amberg's arrogance, but the affective power of the scene relies on the pleasure that we have in the fleeting moment of a peaceable kingdom. <clears throat> Creeping doubt about the inviolability of human dominion seeps into a second painting from 1847 in which Landseer returns to Van Amberg and his big cats. Landseer titled this painting Portrait of Mr. Van Amberg as he appeared with his animals at the London theaters. But the Duke of Wellington, who commissioned the painting, renamed it simply Dominion. 
He also placed it in a frame inscribed with the verses from Genesis around the frame, asserting man's dominion and control over other species from the Bible. The Duke's painting, interestingly, was probably created from the same sketches that Landseer created for his first painting for Queen Victoria. <clears throat> but this, but when we compare this, when we compare the two paintings um, over time, it seems pretty clear from the second painting that Landseer has grown disillusioned with the kind of power manifested in his first painting. Clearly, Landseer's perspective on interspecies harmony had changed, and it seems really significant that here we're kept out of the cage. The focus in this second painting, and I'll go back so you can look at it, is resolutely on species hierarchies and human domination. We are now the only spectators of the cage, and we, the spectators of the painting, stand squarely outside the cage looking through bars. Von Amberg is standing feet apart in a position of command in gladiator dress. He holds a snarling tiger at bay with a whip on one side of the cage as he commands two cowering lion lionesses and an angry lion with his hand and voice on his other side. Here the whip defines the relationship. The muted melancholy light falls only on the human figure and the animals all face away from von Amberg. Again, let me give you the comparison. Louise Lippincott and Andreas Blum, authors of the catalog for the exhibit Fierce Friends, argue that von Amberg's staying hand in the first painting, which manages the tension in the faces of the lion and leopard, and the lamb's very sensible nervousness, asserts man's moral superiority, whereas the later portrait abandons that subtlety and focuses on physical power over the natural world. Perhaps this was because Landseer understood Duke of the Duke of Wellington, his military patron, very well, although they really fought over aspects of this painting that Wellington clearly wanted to look more heroic than Landseer was willing to do. Taken together, the paintings are a powerful reminder that evolution, including the mutation of memes, has little to do with progress. Even as Darwin was anxiously contemplating evidence of deep connections among species, Landseer seems to be withdrawing from human-animal intimacies with wild creatures, distancing the figures in the cage from one another and literally barring spectators from wild animals. Or is the dim lighting, the vulnerability of the gladiator, the abjectness of the animals, and the tawdry refuse. Actually, you can really see it. This, this garbage that's been left by earlier spectators in front of the cage, all a sign of Landseer's disillusion with brute dominion. The paintings insist that once again, human-animal relationships have been founded on dominion and domination, no matter how gentle the force. I'm sorry this illustration is so bad. I found it at the last moment. I didn't have the book. The paintings and periodical fascination with Van Omberg must surely have been a shaping force later in the century in what one could almost call animal porn scenes in adventure novels of Africa and India, like Ryder Haggard's She, an adventure novel first published in serial form in 1886 and 87. In many memoirs of missionaries and in Empire adventure novels, one of the set scenes often completely gratuitously, is what might more precisely be called an animal version of snuff porn. In these scenes, human violence is subsumed into terrifying natural violence as a condition of species contact. In Chi, this novel, the characters take an exhausting, dangerous trip into the heart of Africa. One evening, the impetuous young blonde Viral, and appropriately named Leo, shoots a bullet, bullet into a lioness's open mouth as she and her mate drink from a river's edge. She drops dead, but just as we're recoiling from the shooting, her enraged mate is attacked by a crocodile. 
quote, there was a rush and disturbance of the water such as one sees in a pond in England when a pike takes a little fish, only a thousand times fiercer and larger, and suddenly the lion gave a most terrific snarling roar and sprang forward onto the bank dragging something black with him. The crocodile drags the lion into the water by the hind leg. The lion latches onto the lion's, or the, um, to the crocodile's throat. And a grisly de description of interspecies gore follows that I will spare you. Holly, the Cambridge Don and narrator, concludes, then all of a sudden the end came. The lion's head fell forward on the crocodile's back and with an awful groan he died. And the crocodile, after standing for a moment motionless, slowly rolled over onto his side, his jaws still fixed across the carcass of the lion, which we afterwards found he had bitten almost in halves. This duel to the death, says Holly, was a wonderful and a shocking sight, and one I suppose few men have seen, and thus it ended. In this interspecies sleight of hand, missionaries, novelists, and lion tamers invoke the natural order, the survival of the fittest, to justify their own interspecies violence as hunters who often killed animals for no good reason. If only inadvertently the conclusion of the battle seems to undermine the claim for interspecies competition, because what kind of competition kills off both species? In both paintings and in the novels, the web of action, image, animal, and viewers comprises a signifying system for feelings that nervously circle socially approved barriers to interspecies understanding. But Victorian responses to Victorian art and performance provides nuanced multidimensional and bi-directional evidence of unexpected affect among members of the animal kingdom, including humans. Interpreting that evidence may help us to see what John Plotz has described as the emotional social networks of communication that would soon shape the public's reception to evolutionary theories of Darwin and his scientific colleagues that positioned us, humans, as animals. I began this essay with one spe interspecies cosmology, the Bible, and with the strange interspecies alliances caused by the terrific and traumatic effects of the tsunami. So it seems fitting to close by fast forwarding to our own interspecies encounters, which include human responses to both. The research I'm doing on interspecies attachment is driven by my own desire to understand why the Victorians and my own kind long to connect with other species, even those we kill directly or by destroying their environments. I've been focusing on some of the graver consequences of that desire. To conclude, I want to take another leap in time to the present. I suspect that today, part of our response to strange interspecies attachments among wild animals is actually an act of mourning. It seems no accident that in current memes, the beings who form deep connections across the species divide, like Owen and Mezzi, are orphans and environmental refugees. So I want to close with examples of emerging ways that we in the late 20th and early 21st century are attempting interspecies attachment in addition to the intensification of the meme on social media, and as I notice coming here, at every airport in America, where all of these um, animal unusual relationships seem to be uh, for sale. In the interest of time, and with an honest admission that I'd rather think with you all about our own moment than spend a lot of time on my own early musings, I'm going to give you more of a list than an argument for this closing section. For the most part, and I'll, I'll categorize them. So category one is what I call literal hybridity. For the most part, the scenes in art and fiction I've discussed relish the violence of interspecies interaction. But another set of images reminds us of the longing to become other species, to enter rather than merely interact with animal others. Perhaps this is another reason Landseer's first painting situates viewers in the cage. These two lighthearted images, 
<clears throat> I'll show you another one in a second. Capture that impulse. This first painting is called A Monster from 1866, and it's by another popular animal artist admired by Queen Victoria, Charles Burton Barber. The second <clears throat> is um, a photo advertisement featuring the actress Eliza Blasina, who is the star of The Devil's Auction, and it was very interesting to read what different reviewers call what this was. So some call it a ballet spectacle, another calls it a proto-drama in four acts, Another calls it a drama about which nobody cares because the point of interest is first the dancing, next the dancers, and last the scenery. It was first staged in 1887. But as we face the next major extinction of species, our longing to understand animal interiority has only intensified. One of the early key texts of animal studies was animal philosopher Thomas Nagel, who wrote the article, What Is It Like to Be a Bat? in 1974. Arguing against consciousness as organic physical processes, he famously asserted that, quote, an organism has conscious mental states if and only if there is something that it is like to be that organism, something that it is like for the organism to be in itself. The impossibility of experiencing, experiencing being a bat doesn't stop humans from trying. Some of you may have read reviews recently of two books that appeared simultaneously last year in which humans defy the limitations Nagel sees, pressing beyond the desire to merely form attachments with other species. Both authors long to escape the limitations of their own human species by becoming the other. Charles Foster, a veterinarian, lawyer, journalist, and lecturer in, med in medical ethics, spent six weeks living first as a badger and then as a fox. In his book, Being a Beast, he details burrowing, eating worms, welcoming his young son into this experiment. Almost simultaneously, Thomas Thwaites' Goat Man, How I Took a Holiday from Being Human, was published by Princeton Architectural Press. Both men seek what the New Yorker reviewer Joshua Rothman calls the vivid openness of animality. These literal attempts to live as and with other species are compelling, quixotic, and ultimately unfulfilling. I couldn't help but think as I read these books about H.G. Wells' horrific 1896 novel, The Island of Dr. Moreau, in which the mad vivisector carves non-human animals into animals. Neither knives nor prosthesis can deliver species reassignment. Category two, imagined hybridity. Relying on the imagination rather than on embodiment Many fiction writers are now throwing themselves into the task of species synthesis through imaginative experience, experiments that ultimately seem more satisfying. Ivan Krillkamp, who has a marvelous book coming out on animals in Victorian fiction shortly from the University of Chicago Press, wrote about such novels in a 2015 New Yorker piece called Can Fiction Show Us How Animals Think? Ivan was especially interested in one elephant novel, The Tusk That Did the Damage, by Tanya James from 2015. My own favorite is Barbara Gowdy's 1999 heartbreaker, White Bum. In both cases, the authors actively researched elephants and their culture. James threads together multiple points of view, one of which is that of a dangerous rogue male elephant. The point of view in Gowdy's novel, though, is exclusively located in elephant consciousness. <clears throat> in the rare appearance of humans, they are mere silhouettes of threat. The novel blends realistic details about elephants and impressionistic mystical fantasies of element, psychology, and cosmology, a kind of collective thought process that exists both individually and as a herd collective. When other species enter the novels, like hyenas and humans, their words and thoughts are filtered through the elephant's <clears throat> point of view, and the elephants seem capable of hearing or even absorbing the state of being and thought of these other species. 
The author, Gowdy, spent months at an elephant sanctuary before she wrote the novel, <clears throat> and her observations surfaced not only in elephant behavior, but also in her discussions of the trauma elephants suffer, or the representation, when they're separated from mothers and herds and attacked by poachers. Her book could almost be the elephant unconscious of researcher Gay Bradshaw's <clears throat> scientific study, Elephants on the Edge. What makes Gowdy's novel so valuable to animal studies is its flight from human landscapes and from the aesthetic demands of realist fiction. While thousands of photographs of animal friends continue their circulation and sentimental conception, consumption, white bone reorganizes the universe. Filmmakers are also attempting interesting experiments. You've probably seen films like the Academy Award-winning documentary Winged Migration from 2001, created by Jacques Glissaud, Michelle Glissaud, Michelle Debats, and Jacques Perrin, which attempts to enter animal worlds unobtrusively. Given that the film took four years, traversed seven continents, and required intense training of birds and acclimatizing them to cameras, this kind of interspecies engagement will remain impossible for most of us, but many of us have sought similar experiences by following the egg-laying of eagles, the nest-making of ospreys, and most recently the birth of a giraffe, thanks to the now hundreds of animal webcams that offer humans an unobtrusive view of other species. Finally, category three. As my preference for imaginative versus literal cross-species hybridity suggests, Ironically, the more distant we are from other species, the better we may understand them and serve them, as with the webcams. Paradoxically, my third and final category of 21st century interspecies attachments focuses on species simulacra. These robotic reproductions don't pretend to be real or even highly realistic. This is where we return to tsunamis. The success of robotic animals can be seen as a kind of pyrrhic victory in the struggle among species. Pero is in fact an MCR, a mental commitment robot, designed to promote improvement in three specific areas, psychological, physiological, and social effects, each measured by such observable evidence as vital signs and the in initiation of communication with inpatients and caregivers. Made in the form of a baby seal with enormous eyes and blinking eyelashes, peros were used extensively after the tsunami in Japan in retirement communities to provide comfort, especially to people with dementia and Alzheimer's, people who were devastated by lost homes, lost families, and lost caretakers. No doubt marketers spent hours debating the species Pero should simulate. The question is, why did Pero need to be any species other than human? Pero embodies, if we can even use that word, many of the concerns about human alienation from other humans that Sherry Turkle raises in her book, Together Alone. But he or it <clears throat> also questions whether interspecies attachments require reciprocity. Is genuine acknowledgement of the affective and physical needs of a non-human animal necessary to actualize bonds between humans and other species? As numerous studies have shown, Pero and other non-human companions, robotic companions, do, in fact, provide pleasure and significant improvement in the quality of many people's lives, especially older people. These robots require a little maintenance, but they impose no obligations such as daily feeding, bodily functions, smells, soiling, and grooming. They are complicated animated dolls with whom many of us have also had complicated animated relationships. They are the toy versions of species we buy at zoos, rather than the living animals we keep in captivity in part to satisfy our craving for proximity with other species. They ensure safety to other species that the distance of fiction and webcams also provide. 
What they do not require is domination. In a world where our deep longing for other species so easily leads to their annihilation, is attached detachment to species what we've come to? Is this virtual animal presence all we really wanted? More painfully, is this virtual animal presence all that we, des that we deserve? Thank you.